right, it's your prime. All right. All right, brother Khalif, I think we got it. Shoot. Okay. <laughs> All right, Shukran, good brother. I'm on. Undisclosed? Yeah, you close it. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Had a bit of technical difficulties, uh, but with the help of Brother Khalif and my children, I was able to uh, get it done. All right. So this is uh, Entertainment's War on Family Values uh, for the Mashed Law 2023 Ramadan series. All right. This will be session one. So we have four sessions that we'll be doing. All right. And there'll be a lot of information. Uh, inshallah, it'll be very beneficial. And this little wait, this 16 minute wait that you had to, to endure, um, we'll be able um, to make it up to you. All right. So the subtopic um, for the sessions uh, is the time and what must be done. All right. The time and what must be done. So I'd like to thank, uh, say shukran to Imam Mikhail Shabazz and Brother Khalif. Chestnut and all the presenters at this year's 2023 Ramadan Lecture Series. And we're st we'll start off with the Fatiha. All right. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yamdeen. Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. Ihdina sirat al-musakim. Sirat al-adheen anamta alihim. Gairu al-makdubi alihim. Waladu alim. Ameen. All right. And the translation of that is in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Praise be to Allah, the church as the stain of the worlds, most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment. Thee do we worship thine aid we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy grace, those whose portion is not wrath and who go not astray. All right. So I'm going to start this off with looking at some of the miracles of the Quran. All right, so this will be our little warm up. All right, so we'll talk about a, a few things and then we'll get into the entertainment's war on family values. All right, it says, uh, for those with guidance and understanding, the body of Pharaoh was only discovered in 1898, but the Quran was revealed nearly 1400 years ago. It is almost impossible for a man, Muhammad, to say accurately how a certain thing happened in the ancient past and make a connection with that thing to predict how it would be in the future. So it is clear that the verses from the Quran is nothing but the words of God or the words of Allah, All right? And this is uh, the Quran, chapter 16, verse 36. For we assuredly sent amongst every people an apostle with the command, serve Allah and eschew evil. Of the people were some whom Allah guided and some on whom error became inevitably established. So travel through the earth and see what was the end of those who denied the truth. All right. And we're going to look at a couple of examples of this. So Allah tells us to look at, uh, to travel and, and see uh, what happened to those who uh, were in error. All right. So this is Pharaoh's preserved body. Okay. And this is another picture and you can see how well this body is preserved. All right, for being so old. It says Pharaoh or Pharaoh Ramses II. This is the body of Pharaoh Ramses II believed to be the Pharaoh in the time of the prophet Musa or Moses. His mummy is preserved and is currently on display in the Royal Mummies Chamber in the Grand Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The Quran and the Bible the Bible in Exodus 14, uh, verses 21 to 30, and Exodus 15, uh, 19 to 21, state that the Pharaoh was drowned in the sea. However, the Quran differs from the Bible and makes, it, makes a very unique statement that the body of the drowned Pharaoh was saved as a sign for future generations. The Quranic statement about rescuing, rescuing Pharaoh's body would be in total agreement with the fact that the body of Ramses II has survived in a mummified form. All right. In the Quran, in chapter 10, verses 90 to 92, it says, we took the children of Israel across the sea 
Pharaoh and his host followed them in insolence and spite. At length, when overwhelmed with the flood, he said, I believe that there is no God except him whom the children of Israel believe in. I am of those who submit to Allah and Islam. Okay, so then he submitted. All right. It was said to him, ah, now, but a little while before was thou in rebellion and thou didst mischief and violence. This day shall we save thee in thy body that thou mayest be assigned to those who come after thee. But verily man among mankind, many among mankind, I'm sorry, are heedless of our signs. So very, very powerful uh, statement because you see that this body was preserved. All right, let's move on. There was a French research, researcher, uh, Maurice uh, Bucal, who said, uh, he, Maurice Bacall was trying to uh, discover how this pharaoh died when late at night he concluded his final analysis. The remains of the salt stuck in his body was a shining evidence that he had drowned and that his body was retrieved from the sea swiftly after he drowned. It was also obvious that they rushed to mummify his body so that his body would remain intact. But Maurice puzzled over a question. How did this body, to the exclusion of other mummified bodies of other ancient Egyptians, remain that intact, although it was recovered from the sea? So this Allah tells you he, he was going to preserve his body for the later generations to see what, it, what happened to those who uh, are in error. All right. Another, another case I want to show you is Pompeii. It says, this is not art, it is not imitation. These are their bones, the remains of their flesh and their clothes mixed with plaster. It is the pain of death that takes on body form. Pompeii now contains the bodies of more than 100 people preserved as plaster casts. And this was the people that were destroyed by a volcano. All right, but look at their bodies. And this is why Allah tells us to travel through the earth and see what happened to those people who were in transgression, all right? In Pompeii, there was a lot of homosexuality and all sorts of things going on in that town, all right? And here's another picture, all right? Here, I wanna show you this, all right? This is very interesting, all right? But check this out. In a very distinctive story told by the Holy Quran about the prophet Suleiman or Solomon and a group of ants, the Quran stated that ants can speak to each other. All right. So when they came to the valley of the ants, one of the ants said, oh, ants, enter your dwellings, lest Suleiman or Solomon and his host crush you while they perceive not. So he, Suleiman, smiled and even said her speech. The fact, this fact stated in the Quran 1400 years ago, and for a long time, it was said that this is a big error in the Quran. How could ants speak? However, the scientific world was astonished just in 2009 to discover and listen to ants talking to each other. <laughs> Small talk, very small talk. Scientists have long studied how various creatures communicate. Dolphins in the water, chimpanzees on land, birds in flight. But insects, could they possibly have anything to say? Well, when it comes to the tiny ant, it turns out the answer may be yes. Here's Nick Watt. Ants live in highly structured societies. They are masters of architecture and even agriculture. And now, scientists tell us, ants actually talk to each other. 
Were you surprised when you found? We were. We, yes, we were surprised. <laughs> With an iPod and an old pair of headphones, they discovered worker ants are indifferent to rock music, but stand guard when a distressed queen makes this particular sound. Stand on the speaker with their uh, jones and their mandibles opened, uh, something like saying, I'm the thing, so my queen. Now, no one is saying these little creatures talk like they do in the movies. Just stay calm. We are going around the leap. Around the leap? I, I don't think we can do that. But they do have a kind of language. Look at the back end of the ant. That's the abdomen moving up and down, vibrating. That's how ants make noise. That's how they actually talk to each other. Scientists made these startling discoveries by accident while studying the large blue butterfly. They watched butterfly pupae trick ants into taking them to ant nests and nurturing them until they hatched. Why? Well, amazingly, the butterfly pupae imitate the ant queen's distinctive voice. Butterflies have learned to speak this mysterious ant language, language humans have only just discovered. Nick Watt, ABC News, Turin. So very interesting. Um, because people, we have people that say that Allah or God doesn't exist. And when you look at the miracle of creation, you see there's no way that there could not be a God. There cannot be a, a creator of, of everything. All right. Let's move on because I want to show you something else. Here in the Quran, in chapter 6, verse 25, it says, Of them there are some who pretend to listen to thee, but we have thrown veils on their hearts, mm -hmm. so they understand it not, and deafness in their ears. Mm -hmm. If they saw every one of the signs, not they will believe in them, insomuch that when they come to thee, they but dispute with thee. The unbelievers say, these are nothing but tales of the ancients. All right? And that's what... We have going on now. We have we have a guy named Yuval Harrell, and he he's a, a guy that is involved with this what they call the Great Reset, and he is putting out a lot of information in terms of saying that God doesn't exist, that Allah doesn't exist, you know. But we know from this Quran that Allah exists, and these people have a lot to answer for. All right. But let's move on because I want to show you another one. And I think this one is very, very interesting. This is where the ocean water and the fresh water meet, but they don't mix. You can see that distinct line between the two waters, all right? So many people say that Muhammad wrote the Quran. How would he know all of these things that's going on in the creation? A man that was illiterate, that did not know how to read, but he knew all, he knew all of this information. It came from no other than Allah. So let's hear what the Quran says about this, the meeting of the two waters. The Quran, uh, chapter 55, verses 19 to 20. Then which of the favors of your Lord will ye deny? He has let free the two bodies of flowing water meeting together. Between them is a barrier which they do not transgress. How would this man living in the desert know this information? because this information is from no other than Allah, all right? Here's another verse. 
Quran, uh, chapter 25, verse 53. Uh, uh, 52 and 53. Therefore, listen not to the unbelievers, but strive against them with the utmost strenuousness with the Quran. It is he who has let free the two bodies of flowing water, one palatable and sweet, and the other salt and bitter. Yet has he made a barrier between them, a partition that is forbidden to be passed. All right. And I'd like to welcome uh, Sister Denise and uh, Brother Nassim uh, to the session. Um, what, what do y'all think about that? Y'all have any comments that you want to make about that? That's definitely very interesting. And I've read it before, but seeing is believing. To just right. actually see that visually, you know, that leaves no doubt in the mind. And that's why it's so important. We have to bring this Quran to life for our, for our children. All right. We need to show them because this is what they're up against. They're up against uh, all of this technology and the, the visuals and all of this, these things. And this is what they're used to. A lot of them are not used to just sitting down and reading. That's become kind of boring to them. All right. So we have to bring things to life for the youth. All right. Here's another verse. Same thing. And the, the Quran repeats itself. It repeats itself. And that the reason why it repeats itself is because we learn through repetition. All right. So this is the Quran, uh, chapter 27, verse 61. It says, or who has made the earth firm to live in, made rivers in its midst, set there on mountains immovable, and made a separating bar between the two bodies of the flowing water. Can there be another God besides Allah? Nay, most of them know not. So in this next verse, in uh, Quran chapter 7, verse 57, uh, it is he who sendeth the winds like heralds of glad tidings, going before his mercy. When they have carried the heavy laden clouds, we drive them to a land that is dead, make rain to descend thereon and produce every kind of harvest therewith. Thus shall we raise up the dead, perchance ye may remember. Many people find it hard to believe that we will be resurrected. And basically, if you look at what happens in nature, a lot of resurrect, <laughs> when, when you see the, when the seasons change and you see things dead and then uh, it, it's brought back to life, that's Allah showing you that he, he, he'll easily bring us back to life also. All right. So let's let's move on. And the thing is, Allah tells us not to fret over these people that deny his existence. It says, as to those who reject faith, it is the same to them whether thou warn them or do not warn them. They will not believe. So no matter what we show them, no matter what evidence we bring forth to them, they will still not believe. Right? Those who behave arrogantly on the earth in defiance of right, them will I turn away from my signs. Even if they see all the signs, they will not believe in them. And if they see the way of right conduct, they will not adopt it as the way. But if they see the way of error, that is the way they will adopt. For they have rejected our signs and failed to take warning from them. So, so a lot of these people get caught up in the whispers of shaitan. Okay, because remember, shaitan was given respite to take us from the path of Allah, all right? Even if we did send, Allah is saying, even if we did send unto them angels and the dead did speak unto them and we gathered together all things before their very eyes, they are not the ones to believe unless it is in Allah's plan. But most of them ignore the truth. So Allah, Allah is letting us know that there will be people that will not believe no matter what you show them, no matter what evidence comes to them, they are rejectors of truth. Mm. All right. So let's start talking about entertainment. Now, I did a four part series last year for Ramadan. You can find it on YouTube. Um, it's the same title, um, but you can go back and see some of the things that we 
talked about before. I'm going to show you a little bit of what we discussed uh, before, but I want to try to add on some information. All right. So if you can, you know, make sure you uh, check those um, sessions out. All right. But entertainment, the act of entertaining, agreeable occupation for the mind, diversion and amusement. Something affording pleasure, all right? Diversion or amusement, especially a performance of some kind. So entertainment is amusement and play, all right? And another meaning for the word entertainment is diversion or distraction. So that's why we have so much entertainment in this world, because they want to distract you from important things that's going on, all right? Here's the definition of the word Diversion, an instance of turning something aside from its course, an activity that diverts the mind from tedious or serious concerns, a recreation or pastime. So look at all the forms of entertainment that we have. We have sports, we have television, we have the computer, we have the phone, all of these things to keep us uh, distracted from important things that's going on. We're so focused on Hollywood Housewives, all of these TV shows that we're not seeing what's really going on, all right? So, in the Quran, Allah tells us what's going on, all right? In chapter 29, the story is called The Spider, verse 64, what is the life of this world but amusement and play, all right? And we know that amusement and play is the definition of entertainment. So we can take the word entertainment and put it right there in that verse. What is the life of this world but entertainment? But verily the home and the hereafter, that is the life indeed if they but do. So Allah is telling us, he's told us what it will be going on. This, this, this world is nothing but amusement and play. This is, this is what shaitan uses to take us from uh, the path of Allah. And let me say this. We live in a very wicked system, but it is not man's system. This is shaitan's system. Okay? And that's why this thing goes on and on and on, because this is shaitan's system. And he's been given respite to help to, to try to pull us away from the path and show Allah that we are not worthy of the position that he has given us in creation, all right? This is chapter two, the cow, verse 30. Behold, thy Lord said to the angels, I will cre create a vicegerent on earth. They said, well, thou place therein one who will make mischief therein and bloodshed and, and shed blood whilst we do celebrate thy praises and glorify thy holy name. He said, I know what you know not. But what I want to focus on here is a vice journal. All right. I will create a vice journal on earth. Can somebody tell me what that means? What is a vice journal? I believe it's like a caretaker or someone who's supposed to take care of a specific thing. Absolutely. Excellent answer. Because this is the textbook def definition of vice chairman. It says, an officer appointed as deputy by and to a sovereign or supreme chief. A deputy in general. All right? So we are the deputy in charge of the earth for the short time that we're here. All right? It says, a person appointed to exercise all or some of the authority of another especially the administrative powers of a rule, all right? So we are the deputy and the deputies in charge of this earth for this short period of time. Because remember, we are only here for a time, all right? But I want, any, anybody want to say anything about that, that our, about our role as the vice gerent of the earth? All right, well, Let's move on. I'm going to move on to this because I want you to hear this brother. It's a Native American brother, but I want you to hear what he says in this piece. Mm -hmm. 
time evolves and comes to a place where it renews again. There is first a purification time, then there is renewal time. We are getting very close to this time now. We were told that we would see America come and go. In a sense, America is dying from within because they forgot the instructions on how to live on earth. Now, he's being nice. He said they forgot the instructions on how to live here on the earth. But it's not that they forgot. They are in serious rebellion. All right? They are doing everything. They're flipping everything around. All right? They're doing, they're making what Allah has deemed unrighteous. They're making it righteous. All right? They're making it the thing to do. All right? So this man feels as though he is an adversary to Allah. Everything is coming to a time where prophecy and man's inability to live on earth in a spiritual way will come to a crossroad of great problems. It's the Hopi belief, it's our belief that if you're not spiritually connected to the earth and understand the spiritual reality of how to live on earth, it's likely you will not make it. When Columbus came, that began what we term as the First World War. That was the true First World War when Columbus arrived. Because along with him came everybody from Europe. By the end of the Second World War, we were in America, we were only 800,000 from 60 million to 800,000. So we were almost exterminated here in America. Very deep. 60 million to 800,000. And the fact that it doesn't even seem like the, the Native American was ever here. They pushed them out of their land. Mm -hmm. and they created all types of genocides and they reduced their numbers okay anybody anybody want to have a comment yeah it seems like um this is something that's been going on wherever these people step foot like they have a pattern of that behavior mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 it, and it's very, very interesting because we know it's not a thing of uh, black or white or no, it's about righteousness. Okay, and these these people, that's what they're going to be judged on, not their skin color, but righteousness, because Allah doesn't judge us on our skin color. He judges us on our righteous deeds. All right. But you are absolutely right. When they, these uh, conquerors, these people with this unrighteous mindset have gone to many lands, they've done horrible things. All right. <laughs> but why do you think they try to reduce a people's population? I would think um, at the same time, they would be increasing their own population to actually take over and control an area or a land. Do they want to have total dominance over that area or that land? 
Mm-hmm. That would be my that would be my theory. And and also to to reduce the the numbers so that they'll be easier to to control. Right. Right. And the thing is that a lot of people don't realize or understand that this is this 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 is Shaitan's. <laughs> this is the whispers of Shaitan. This is what he whispers and gets people to do. The thing is, is that this thing of reducing population has been around for a long time and it's very strong and prevalent now. And I'm gonna show you just how strong uh, and prevalent it is, inshallah, all right? Let's stay with me. Everything is spiritual. Everything has a spirit. Everything, everything was brought to you by the creator, the one creator. Some people call him God. Some people call him Buddha. Some people call him Allah. Some people call him other names. We call him Tonkashila, grandfather. And you can see Allah says that you know, he said, uh, I mean, more messengers than we know about uh, on the earth. All right. The Quran only discusses some of Allah's messengers. But the thing is, is that this man, he sounds like he sounds like he's Muslim. He's talking about the oneness of God. He's talking about the one God. OK, so it's, it's, it's very, 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 uh, very interesting. <laughs> We're here on Earth only a few winters. Then we go to the spirit world. The spirit world is is more real than most of us believe. The spirit world is, is everything. Over 95% of our body is water. And in order to stay healthy, you've got to drink good water. When the European first came here, Columbus, we could drink out of any river. If the Europeans had lived the Indian way when they came, we'd still be drinking out of water because water is sacred. The air is sacred. Our DNA is made of the same DNA as the tree. The tree breathes what we exhale. When the tree exhales, we need what the tree exhales. So we have a common destiny with the tree. We are all from the earth. And when the earth, the water, the atmosphere is corrupted, then it will create its own reaction. Mother is reacting. In the Hopi prophecy, they say the storms and floods will become greater. To me, it's not a negative thing to know that there will be great changes. It's not negative. It's evolution. When you look at it as evolution, it's time. Nothing stays the same. Sedan Darwin skrev sitt berömda verk om arternas uppkomst har vetenskapen varit övertygad om att människan härstammar från arterna. I want, I want you to listen to what he's, he says here about uh, these apes. We always say, that might be your ancestor, but it's not our ancestor. He is a relative, but not our ancestor. So he, he right there debunks the, <laughs> their belief of evolution. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
You said that might be your ancestors, but it's not our ancestors. You learn how to plant something. That's the first connection. You should treat all things as spirit. Realize that we are one family. It's never something like the end. It's like life. There is no end to life. So a lot of the things that he's saying is, is, is so like he like he's a Muslim. <laughs> like, like, like he, we're following the same thing. Okay. He, he's talking about the oneness of God. You, you'll have different names for God because we got different people from different lands with different languages. All right. But we know that the ultimate name for God is Allah. The God. Okay. Because there's people that they worshiped all kinds of things throughout history. People worship the sun. People worship celebrities. Uh, all sorts of things. But the thing is, even some people even put ascribe partners to Allah, which we know is wrong because Allah is one. Allah is one. Allah is the ultimate. All right. But now I want to show you this. This is the Phoenix. All right. And a lot of people, the, the, the people that run these fraternities that run the system, they, uh, are heavy, heavily into the occult. And one of the big things in the occult is the story of the phoenix, all right? It says in ancient Greek folklore, a phoenix is a long-lived bird that cyclically regenerates or is otherwise born again. Associated with the sun, a phoenix obtains new life by arising from the ashes of its predecessor. Some legends say it dies in a show of flames and combustion, Others, that it simply dies and decomposes before being born again. This story of the phoenix is what's going on now. They are going to destroy this country and rebuild it in the image that they want it to be. They're going to destroy the old world order and try to create this new world order or this uh, great reset as they're now calling it, okay? But now some people say, oh, my brother, you're a conspiracy theorist. Well, you talking this stuff. Let's look, let's look at the evidence. When you look at the back of this dollar bill, you see a few things, all right? You see the word here, Novus Ordu Secolorum, all right? That means new order of the world, new order of the world, all right? You see this strange pyramid with the eye, all right? You see over here, it says E Pluribus Unum, right? E Pluribus Unum on the, the uh, uh, ribbon that the eagle has in its mouth, all right? And there's a whole lot of symbolism on this dollar bill, all right? And this, this dollar bill was created by a, uh, a, a Freemason, okay? But it's, it's, it's a lot to this, all right? But I want to show you something else. This is a lady named uh, Alice Bailey. She was a student of an occultist named uh, Helena Blavatsky, okay? And I'm gonna try to show you just how much the occult plays in this world, all right? But this was their 10-point plan for a new world order. It says, Al Alice Bailey, 10-point strategy for a new world order. And we, we discussed this in detail in, in the prior uh, session. It says, take, the first thing was to take God and prayer out of the education system. Now, this was written around the time near World War I or World War II, all right? It says, reduce parental authority over children. 
Number three, destroy the traditional Christian family structure. Number four, if sex is free, make abortion legal and easy. Number five, make divorce easy and legal. Free people from the concept of marriage for life. Okay. Number six, make homosexuality an alternative lifestyle. Number seven, debase art and make it run mad. Number eight, use media to promote and change mindset. Number nine, create an interfaith movement, that, which I don't see as a problem with that in terms of uh, believers coming together, all right? Because we are up against um, some, <laughs> some, <laughs> we have some heavy, heavy uh, evil that we're dealing with, all right? And we have to come together. You know, that's the only way that we're going to be able to um, fight against, you know, this system. All right. Number 10, get governments to make all these laws, all these law and get the church to endorse these changes. All right. And this is all of these things have happened and we've seen them happen. All right. Let's move on. It says the dreamers of the day are dangerous men for they may act their dream with open eyes to make it possible. This quote from Justice William O. Douglas says, as nightfall does not come all at once, neither does oppression. In both instances, there is a twilight when everything remains seemingly unchanged. And it is in such a twilight that we all must be most aware of change in the air. However, slightless, we become unwitting, unwitting victims of the darkness, all right? So this stuff is happening gradually, but now it's starting to speed up. All right, it's it's speeding up on us. It's like my grip. It's like my <laughs> All right, now we look at this. It says, um, this is a quote from Naomi Wolf. She's done a lot of um, research into the digital surveillance technologies, okay? And she does a lot on what they call RFID. All right, but she said, I hope we wake up quickly because history shows as a small window in which people can fight back before it is too dangerous to fight back. But the thing is, is that people, the masses have, have become almost zombified. It's like the walking dead. And like Brother Nassim said last time, like, walking dead morally, walk, walking dead physically and spiritually. All right. But now, I want to talk to you about a uh, article that we had discussed and work at my job. And this article talked about an African greeting, all right? And the African greeting was, how are the children? And the response would be, the children are fine. How are the children? And the response, the children are fine because they knew the importance of the children, right? It says, I'm gonna pop in here a couple of times and talk about, uh, because one of the subtopics of uh, this uh, Ramadan series was the time and what must be done. So there's one thing, all right, that must be done. We must begin to invest in our children because they are the future generation. This wicked system understands this. This is why they want your children at an early age so that they can indoctrinate them into this system. That's why they have so many early childhood programs because they wanna get your child at an early age and indoctrinate them with their belief systems. They want to instill their beliefs, morals and values into them instead of Allah's guidance. Okay, I'm not on. Educationalists <clears throat> should take the hint from the dictum of Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuit order. It says, give me a child until he is seven and I will give you the man. What do you think they meant by that? Give me a child until he is seven and I will give you the man. Anybody want to take that one? Uh, yeah, uh, as you can see with these uh, 
drag queen story hours. <laughs> it's like this they got going on in different places. They're definitely trying to get to the children and instill those types of values with within them at an early age. You know, it's just blatant outright immorality. Mm. You know, and it is is you know they they have no fear or no uh, regard for the creator at all. Mm. So, and they know that the early years of a child that's their formative years, and those years are very important because that that they're saying that that's going to make the person those years kind of helps to, to really determine how that person is going to be when they get older. Of course, we know that they people can change when they when they get older, but the thing is, is that they're saying at that age, the, the, a child is, I mean, up to that age, a child absorbs things uh, uh, easily, like a sponge. They soak things up, all right? So I found that a, a, as a very interesting point. But even the Bible would tell us, it says, train up a child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. So it's the importance of instilling things in our children, what we instill in them when they are young. All right. What do y'all think about this? Because we we were taught we had a discussion about this um, this thing of you know the, the African greeting and how are the children. Um, but somebody said it takes a village to raise a child. How many of y'all agree with that? Uh, I definitely agree because uh, kids, things are repetitive. So mm -hmm. if they see repetitive behavior, good or bad, then more than likely they're going to adopt that behavior. So if they see something in the home, you know, that's going on, positive or negative, but then they go out into the environment and they see the same thing over and over, then more than likely they're going to adopt that thing as normal in their minds and, and it's gonna stay with them. Even like in the fact, you know, the fact that, uh, you remember that McDonald's, that uh, commercial back in the day was on a Big Mac. You know, everybody knows what's on it because we was programmed. Mm -hmm. You see something nine times within 21 days, it usually stays programmed in your, in your psyche forever. <laughs> All right. Anybody else wanna take that? It takes a village to raise a child, is that? What do you think about that? Does it take a village to raise a child? Does it take the community to raise the child? All right, let's move on. Because when they said that, I said, it takes a village to raise a child, but what if the village is sick? Yeah. What if the village is sick? Mm -hmm. Right? Because do you want a sick village raising your child? <laughs> right, your right. Child? You definitely got to be on, on point with what environments your children are exposed to. Right. So the, the, the thing is, is that, you know, the, the things that our children are being exposed to, a lot of immoral things, all right? Um, and it's shaping their behaviors. And it's shaping the type of person that they are going to become. All right. But now, how many, how many of you remember this the old movie, The Golden Child? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Eddie Irvin, 1986. Everybody was wearing those hats and, and everything, right? But that movie was an interesting movie. All right. Can, can anybody summarize what, what the movie was about? The golden child. I could barely remember. I know it was something that was about a, a child he had to rescue from from something. That's, I could barely, it's so long ago. Yeah, so it was, it was a child that needed to be rescued, all right? But the thing is, is that who, who was this child? Who were they saying the child was? The golden child. He's the golden <laughs> child. He was. <laughs> he was. He was the one that was supposed to bring about positive change. All right. There was a lot in this movie that, a lot of times when you see a, a, a movie, and then you come back to it and watch it later on as you get older and experience some things, you start to see a lot of things going on. All right. 
But let's look at this. This is a, this is a clip from, from that team. I'm going to speed up just a little bit. There's a particular part I want you to see. All right. You will eat. Get this and the rest of your playthings out of here. So they were trying to get him, this, this guy was trying to get him to eat a bowl of oatmeal. But within that oatmeal, it was blood, all right? So now, if you can see, and, and like I told you before, there's a lot of stuff dealing with the occult in this society, all right? But you can even see here in this movie what they have here. This is an occultic symbol, all right? But now they wanted to, they wanted the golden child who was supposed to be this savior type figure to consume the, 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 the oatmeal with the blood in so that it could defile him. All right. Let's look at the word defile. Defile. To make unclean or impure. To corrupt the purity or perfection of. Debase. To uh, violate the chastity or vir virginity of or to deflower to make physically unclean, especially with something unpleasant or contaminating, to violate the sanctity of, and desecrate, sully, or dishonor. All right? This is what's going on with our children. They are trying to defile our children and us. They're trying to keep us from being pure and clean, mentally and spiritually. All right? Mentally, physically, and spiritually. All right? But now, let me show you this, because I think this is a quote from James Allen from his book, As a Man Thinking. It says, out of a clean heart comes a clean life and a clean body. Out of a defiled mind proceeds a defiled life and a corrupt body. All right? Out of a clean heart comes a clean life and a clean body. Out of a defiled mind proceeds a defiled life in a corrupt body. All right. Hey, brother Rashid. Hey, what's going on, good brother? Salam alaikum. Like it's good to see you. Good to I'll see you. you back. Can, can you go back to that? Yeah, sure. Yep. Which which one? Uh, defiled. The quote, the quote. The quote. The quote. Okay. Go ahead. So so look at it. It says a clean heart, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then the second sentence uh, out of a, a out, out of a defied mind. Mm -hmm. So you got heart and mind. Right. There, there's that connection. Excellent. Right? And, 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 and I remember uh, listening to uh, Imam uh, Fahim Shway. He was saying, like, when, when, when a human is born and in that, and in, in, in it's, uh, when, it's in, when, the, when the baby is in his mother, the, mm -hmm. first, the, first, the first organ that is, that is created is the heart. Mm -hmm. the, second, the second organ is the mind. Mm -hmm. 
So the fact that he, you know, he starts out with heart and then and connects the not the mind is is is, is you know it's just kind of like a confirmation yeah. That, yeah. that you know. Yeah. We well, are. And, and the thing is, is that watch this though, because because watch watch where we're gonna go with this. All right, watch where we're gonna go with this. Very interesting. All right, because it says you are what you eat or you are mm. what you consume. Mm. All right. So look at what they have our children consume. All right. Nicki Minaj, Megan Thee Stallion, gun this, gun that. Right. You are what you eat or you are what you consume. That it becomes a part of you. All right. And people don't realize that. How, how important. It's, it's very simple. But people don't really think about it. The reason for the gun violence in the Black community is that this system fears something from our youth that would disrupt this system. Mm. Okay? They fear something from our children. That is why we got the violence. That is why we have, uh, in the Black community, these uh, uh, artificial environments set up. Okay, because these these environments are not really found in other people's cultures. It's, it's mainly us, right? But they put these things to uh, corrupt. They want to corrupt corrupt our children. All right, and the, like I said, it's, it's it's a you know they want to corrupt any child. All right, because even when you talk about neighborhoods like Kensington. Right. Look at look at look at Kensington. Look at the stuff that's going on in Kensington. You got people of all races and colors walk around there, almost some of them looking like zombies. Right. But let's look at this. Anonymous cool. If you wish to destroy an area, how do you do it? There are two ways. You can go in there and bomb it and so forth, but that is not very efficient. What you do is you try to get the people in that area to kill each other and destroy their own territory, their own farms. And that's, what, that's what's been done in that area. The way in which you destroy an opponent is to get him to destroy himself by dividing his ranks against one another. Then you feed both sides. Mm -hmm. You have agents feeding both sides, inflaming both sides, and they kill each other off. And it is time that some of us woke up to this reality. To understand that people who try to maintain empires and great empires do it by manipulating the people they're trying to conquer. Hotel Rwanda at its best. Right. Hotel, but there's a lot of places. Yeah. Hotel Rwanda, this particular, this particular one was talking about um, Iraq when they went in and destabilized Iraq. Right, the same right. game. Yeah, same yeah. game. It's this, it's, it goes back to NSSM uh, 200, all right? If you, if you look up NSSM, well, we'll talk about it, but NSSM 200 was a plan that they had to kind of um, uh, de destroy the population in Africa, all right? But the thing is, is this. You know, we see this very thing that they're doing here now. Mm -hmm. This is what's going on in our, in our communities. And the one thing um, that, you know, uh, that, that really bothers me, the other day a little boy came up to me and he said, he said, uh, Mr. Abdul, he said, uh, uh, are you a Salafi? And I said, I'm a Muslim. And then he said, he, I guess he thought I didn't hear him, but he said again, he said, Mr. Abdullah, are you a Salafi? I said, no, I'm Muslim. In the Quran, Allah tells us, he says, do not divide your way of life up into sex. Mm. Right? He says, I named you Muslim. Do, he said that if anyone that's doing that, then you're supposed to stay away from that. And Allah has told you that he will decide between us on the day of judgment. Division, that's, this, is, this is what this is about. 
if we if there's no unity among Muslims, you got some calling themselves Sophie, you got some calling them Sufi, you got some calling them, uh Sunni, you got some calling them Shiite. Come on. What's going on? That's this is not what Allah told us. And a lot of us are focusing on what, what other people are telling us, but we have to follow what Allah says. We have to follow the instruction of Allah. And Allah tells you, do not break up your deen into sex. But it go back to what you just, that other quote, you are what you consume. You right? are what you consume, right. And the thing is, is that this, this, this is, is another one of those uh, the time and what, what needs to be done, this is another one. We have to unify as Muslims. We have to unify with other believers because we're all under attack. Mm -hmm. You know? So, you know, some brothers, oh, that brother don't know what he's talking about. No. Okay. I don't know what I'm talking about. Then you read your Quran. Read what Allah says in the Quran. I'm not following anybody's guidance but Allah's. Okay? But now let's look at this. I want you to see this trailer. This is, okay, I had to check my time, all right? Oh, so this is another one of those things they're doing. <laughs> so, so sometimes uh, some of the videos get, uh, get blocked or they get removed, but let me tell you what this trailer was about. Um, this was sometime in the 70s. I think it was 71. Don't quote me, but I think it was 71. This group, uh, it was a white group, and they went out to media PA to an FBI office, and they stole documents. And the documents they stole were the COINTEL Pro documents. All right, that was up amongst the, the all of the documents that they stole. Um, but when they looked at these documents, uh, they found that this COINTEL Pro stated this. It said uh, that they had infiltrated uh, the black groups in the, in the 60s and 70s, and that they were trying to infiltrate them to kind of uh, destroy the unity among them, all right, and to try to cause problems within the various groups. But they said they were watching certain figures because the goal was to prevent the rise of a black messiah. Mm. The goal was to, and this is what's stated in the documents, to prevent the rise of a black messiah. So who were they watching at the time? They were watching Malcolm, they, Malcolm X, they were watching Elijah Muhammad, they were watching Stokely Carmichael, and they were watching uh, Martin Luther King Jr. For Martin Luther, I mean, for uh, Malcolm X, they said he had, he had so, uh, so much potential so what did they do they got rid of him right away mm -hmm. right elijah muhammad they said they weren't worried about elijah muhammad because he was too old they said stokely carmichael they just mentioned him as having potential but they said what they said about king was they said that king um they weren't worried about king as long as he was following their agenda this is what it states in the documents. This is what they said. This is not what I'm saying. This is what they said. And if you think about it, um, that's why that's one of the reasons why they would always push King on us. But the thing is that when King started going against their agenda, what happened to him? Do you think? Do you, do you think he started going against their agenda once he went to uh, uh, when he met uh, what's his name Gandhi? And and he uh, kind of had a different perspective. Mm -mm. Uh -uh. They the the, <laughs> the reason why uh, it wasn't really about uh, God. Well, a lot of people don't know Gandhi was very prejudiced against blacks. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and uh, the person that introduced King to the the, the Gandhi uh, concept was a guy named uh, Bertrand Russell, all right? And you have to do some research in him. He's, a, he's an interesting person. Um, but uh, when King started speaking out against the war in Vietnam, when he started um, having conversations with Malcolm, 
okay? This, this is why they wanted to get rid of, okay? When he, they, they, they uh, felt like he could have that potential too, but as long as he was doing what they wanted him to do, then he was fine, right? This is a clip from the movie Judas and the Black Messiah, all right? But they even mentioned it, watch. I'm gonna share something with you. Like the masses, I was in awe. When I first laid eyes on all the things you are, I heard that speech. I knew we made noise. I just started being in the streets. The Black Panthers are the single greatest threat to our national security. Our counterintelligence program must prevent the rise of a Black Messiah. It was right there in the trailer. Mm. You're looking at 18 months for the stolen car, five years for impersonating a federal officer, or you can go home. What do you want? Get close to Hampton. The Black Panthers are forming a rainbow coalition of oppressed brothers and sisters of every color. Neutralize him by any means necessary. America's on fire right now. And until that fire is extinguished, nothing else will a damn thing. Imagine what we could accomplish together. We can heal this whole city. You ain't tell me. A See, a, a, a lot of people. It's like breadcrumbs. Allah has left us these breadcrumbs to uh, come to the truth. He has left us these different puzzle pieces, and we have to assemble them and put them together so we, that we can see the truth. The thing is, is that uh, King, if you remember in the Malcolm X movie, oh, well, let me say this first. King received a letter that told him that he might as well commit suicide. Uh, because of the infidelities that the mm -hmm. that the FBI had found out about him, they were surveilling him, and they sent him sent him that letter. And he, if you remember, in the in the movie Malcolm X, uh, when they were surveilling Malcolm, and they were on, uh, they were talking like after he had hung up the phone, I think towards the end of the movie, they had said that this he said this guy's a saint compared to King. And that's because King, I mean, Malcolm was so disciplined. He was, he was that FOI disciplined uh, person. But the thing is, is that uh, they, they couldn't really get anything on him immoral, but King they had. Yep. So it was a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff going on. All right. But this is the COINTEL, this is from the document. The COINTEL Pro goals. It says, uh, number two, to prevent the rise of a Messiah who could unify and electrify the militant Black nationalist movement. Malcolm X might have been such a Messiah. He is the martyr of the movement today. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and Elijah Muhammad all aspire to this position. Elijah Muhammad is less of a threat because of his age. King could be a very real contender for this position should he abandon his supposed obedience to white liberal doctrines. Mm. Nonviolence. Violence. You know, they were sicking dogs on people, uh, spraying them with hoses, uh, fire hoses, beating them, the cops are beating them and stuff. Right. Nonviolence. As long as y'all don't do to us what we do to y'all, it's cool. Abs right, absolutely. So they would, they would want somebody that's preaching nonviolence, okay? Uh, imagine if they would have tried to use nonviolence against uh, Hitler, mm. right? It says, Carmichael has the necessary charisma to be a, a real threat in this way. So prevent militant Black nationalist groups and leaders from gaining respectability by discrediting them to three uh, separate segments of the community. 
The goal of discrediting black nationalists must be handled tact tactically in three ways. You must discredit those groups and individuals to first the responsibility a responsible uh, Negro community. Second, they must be discredited to the white community, both the responsible community and to the liberals who have vestiges of sympathy for militant black nationalists simply because they are Negroes. Third, these groups must be discredited in the eyes of Negro radicals, the followers of the movement. This last area requires entirely different tactics from the first two. Publicity about violent tendencies and radical statements merely enhances black nationalists to the last group. It adds respectability in a different way. A final goal should be to prevent the long range growth of militant black organizations, especially among youth. Specific tactics to prevent these groups from converting young people must be developed. So they even talked about how they could, um, let me see how they, exactly how they put it, uh, where they want to discredit them. So they were able to discredit King because of his infidelities. So that's why they were telling him to commit suicide, commit suicide because they, they knew he didn't want the people to find out what was really going on, all right? But now let's look at this because what you're seeing happening in this country is similar to the story of Moses, right? King James Bible, Exodus chapter one, verses eight to 16. Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph or Yusuf. And he said unto his people, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get up out of the land. So it's the same thing. It's the same, it's the same story. They, uh, it's just like in the story of Moses where the, the Pharaoh got that wind of a savior coming. So what did he start to do? He started murdering who? The firstborn male children, right? It's, this, it's, this, it's the same thing. Mm. Therefore, they, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities Pithom and uh, Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter and with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the, to the Hebrew midwives of which the name of of the one was Shipra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, it, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Mm. All right. So what's happening? All of this stuff there, they're feeding, uh, especially our young males with this uh, thing of, um, being tough, the rap music, you gotta have a gun, all, all of these uh, horrible examples of what manhood is, all right? And they have them out there killing themselves, right? The reason Pharaoh ordered the newborn males to be killed, Pharaoh ordered them to be killed because he thought there was too many Israelites. After his first attempt to try and persuade the Israelites to not have children by giving them a hard and crucial slave life, Pharaoh was scared they would grow into a, a too large of a number and try to fight against the Egyptians. You it's, know, when you, when you say that, I think about, you know, think about the experience of slavery and, and how rigorous that was on us as people, but they didn't understand that in, in all of that rigor, they were creating the next, the next generation of basketball players, football players, scientists like they didn't realize that they was doing all of that in the process then you know uh they well, just didn't realize that well just uh, just as just as they uh, pl uh plot a lot of plans right yeah 
Pharaoh claimed that the high Israel, Israelite birth rate could pose a potential threat. He used that as an excuse to kill, kill their newborn boys. All right, so there, it's the same story, y'all. It's the same story happening. They fear something coming from amongst our people that will disrupt their system. So they feel like they have to uh, annihilate them. All right. This is what it said in the Quran. This is chapter 40, Surah Muhammad or the Believer, verses 25 to 26. It says, so when he brought to them the truth from us, they said, slay the sons of those who believe with him and keep their women alive. And the struggle of the unbelievers will only come to a state of perdition. And Pharaoh, or, uh, Pharaoh said, let me alone that I may slay Musa or Moses and let him call upon his Lord. Surely I fear that he will change your religion or that he will make mischief to appear in the land. So Pharaoh didn't want these people there that were going to disrupt his system. You know, he, he didn't want the, he didn't want Moses to change their religion because their religion was the worship of him. So he did things to, to try to eliminate their progeny. Right. But now this is I want you to see. This is an original depiction of Jesus. And this was around 400 AD drawn in the Roman catacombs. So remember, the um, early Christians had to seek shelter in, in, in caves and, and, and uh, worship in secrecy. But they would draw this, draw certain things on the on the walls. All right. The Christian catacombs are extremely important for the art history of early Christian art, as they contain great, the great majority of examples from before about 400 AD in fresco and sculpture. So if this dates back to 400 AD, and this is depicting Jesus as being black, <laughs> it's like, you know, why are they, why are they uh, changing the image? They know something about our people that we don't know. Mm. Let's go on. Here's another picture drawn in the rate the 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 uh, caves in, in in Rome. Image of Christ and his disciples drawn by the early Christians from the fourth century A.D. And you can see all of them are black. All of them are black. So they don't want us to know uh, the, the greatness that we come from. And just because they were black doesn't make us better, but it just shows the truth. It's, it's a verse in the Bible that said that and the truth will set you free. This is why our self-esteem, you know, coming up, a lot of our self-esteem was low because everything that was positive, it was, it was, it was white. It also, uh, it shows you have to be careful whose table you're eating from. Mm. Right. Absolutely. Or the, the indoctrination. Right, you are what you consume. So you if you consume the bad food, you're gonna get sick. Right. Here's another one. This is this is a, a, a coin. All right. But as you can see, you look at this coin here, and you'll see the hair and the features of is is of a black person. This was a coin depicting depicting Jesus. All right. And I don't, I don't really like to, to use the term Jesus because his name was Isa, Isa ibn Miriam, Isa the son of Miriam. But I want to show you what they did with that. Uh, maybe maybe I, I can do that in this presentation. Here's a depiction of Moses and his brother and the, and the Israelites. All right. So it, it's, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there that shows you that these people have been giving us a false narrative, right? Even Samson, this was a picture of Samson drawn in the Rome, in the, in the caves in Rome, all right, by the early Christians. But this is what they fear. Let me show you what they, oh wait, I have one more. This other one is uh, Jonah, all right? The story of Jonah in the well. All right. And then I want you to hear this system. All right. 
because they don't know they don't know where this uh, uh, inspiration might come from. All right, and this is why they are, you know, doing things on such a massive scale and trying to defile the youth. But listen, listen to this young sister. Since Iran's Cultural Revolution in 1979, Iranian women covered by black chadors and hijabs have become the stereotypical image of the country's religious and political identity. But now women in the Middle East and in the U.S. are using their clothes as a way to express themselves and their political beliefs in bold new ways. Fashion blogger grew up in Oklahoma. Thank you so much for having me. So you are an Iranian American that grew up in Oklahoma. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, um, it was it was quite the experience. Definitely, I think um, when I first started wearing the hijab or head scarf in sixth grade, that was easily the worst year of my life because um, Oklahoma is very homogeneously white and conservative state. And so I was physically assaulted. People tried to pull off my hijab. It was basically like a year, several years of trauma um, that I basically had to go through. And for me, that really led into where I kind of am today and made me look about fashion in different ways and the way that how we dress really impacts the way that people engage with us. So but, if I wore a scarf yeah. around my neck, I probably wouldn't have gotten punched in the face. But even today in, let's say, more mainstream areas, you still have people who have a view of what you are and what you're about based mm -hmm. on what you're wearing what do you how would you describe that yeah definitely i mean i think that it's i think anti-muslim racism in this country is beyond sort of the individual bias against each other it really has to do with um we live in a system and a structure that actually profits from violence against muslims so when we look at where a lot of anti-muslim propaganda is coming from we can see actually weapons manufacturers are invested in basically perpetuating anti-muslim bias surveillance companies um and even like countries like israel which actually profit from dehumanization of muslims are all part of this larger system that creates this individual bias that affects people on the individual level. I'm curious as a fashion blogger how you think fashion influences all of this. So I'm, I'm and we were looking back at some pictures mm -hmm. in Iran and how cosmopolitan uh, some of the major cities were back before 1979, the mm -hmm. revolution. I think we have some of those pictures here. Mm -hmm. Do you think you want you would like to see Iran go back to that before women were wearing hijabs, or would you like to be meeting somewhere in the middle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think these photos being seen out of context is always um, really decontextualizing what actually was taking place in yeah. the country. So the people who dressed um, in the sort of Western dress that we're seeing now are actually a very minority group of people. They're oh. upper class people. So if you wore a hijab, there's actually a period of mandatory unveiling where someone could actually pull the hijab off of you. So it was an incredibly violent time and very intolerant. Um, but we kind of see these images of this nostalgia of like, oh, we want to go back to this time, but we have to understand that this isn't actually how the majority of Iranians mm. live. So actually images of like mini skirts of Afghanistani women were shown toward, uh, were shown to Trump earlier this month as an ex uh, excuse for why the U.S. should keep troops on the ground because, oh, we should like go back to the time where Muslim women or Afghan women were wearing mini skirts, but we don't understand that if we look at education levels, you know, like education of women in Iran right now, far greatly exceeds what it was back during this time when women were wearing mini skirts. So if we want to talk about women's rights, let's talk about more like their social economic status rather than just what they're wearing. Let's talk about nuclear weapons. Okay. Our, our, our viewers, <laughs> some of our viewers may say, we cannot trust Iran. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I mean, I don't think we can trust this country. I mean, what has this country done to the majority of the countries in the Middle East? You know, like, I, I don't think Iran's having nuclear weapons. I'm a pacifist. I don't, I don't believe in violence. Um, but also, when we look at the legacy of imperialism and um, colonization in the Middle East, and we see the legacy of this country and all of the violence that it has not only created, but also created the capacity for. Um, a lot of these weapons in the Middle East are completely brought in by the United States. A lot of Americans might take offense to that. You're an American. I you don't yeah. sound like an American. You, say, but you know what <laughs> That's I mean? Because I'm red, you know? Yeah. And I think that it's really important that we look beyond sort of these, these really simple narratives that we're told, whether it's about Muslim women, whether it's about the legacy of this country, and knowing that this country literally was built on the backs of black slaves and after um, the genocide of indigenous people. And I think there's a lot that we can be proud about, but I think that we shouldn't let that sort of blindsight us for the realities of the situation. Well, you can check out Hoda's blog at jujuazad.com. And you have a fashion show coming up. Tell us about that. They weren't expecting her to be able to deal with them the way that she did. Hmm.
She killed them when she said it's because I read. <laughs> <laughs> she said I'm red, right? <laughs> she killed them with that. But let's do, let's see if we can squeeze in two more, all right? If I went to Israel, I don't think Israel would be the best place for me to be at this time, considering the view that most Jews have of Louis Farrakhan. You go to Nigeria, which is, if not the most corrupt nation in Africa, and it is, it could be the most corrupt nation in the world, Minister Farrakhan. Oh, and now, Mr. Wallace, <laughs> it is the most corrupt nation that I have ever covered. I've been there 25 years ago, and I've been there as recently as last year. Fine. So what? 35 years old. That's what that nation is. Now, here's America, 226 years old. You love democracy, but it's there in Africa. You're trying to force these people into a system of government that you just have accepted 30 years ago, black folk got the right to vote. You're not in any moral position to tell anybody how corrupt they are. You should be quiet and let those of us who know our people go there and help them get out of that condition. But America should keep her mouth shut wherever there's a corrupt regime, as much hell as America has raised on the earth. No, I will not allow America or you, Mr. Wallace, to condemn them as the most corrupt nation on earth when you have spilled the blood of human beings. Has, has Nigeria dropped an atomic bomb and killed people in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Have they killed off millions of Native Americans? How dare you put yourself in that position as a moral judge? I think you should keep quiet because with that much blood on America's hands, you have no right to speak. I will speak because I don't have that blood on my hands. Yes, there's corruption there. Yes, there's mismanagement of resources. Yes, there is abuse. There's abuse in every nation on earth, including this one. So let's not play holy to moralize on them. Let's help. Them. I'm not moralizing. I'm asking you a question and I got an answer. Why would you put it as the most corrupt regime in the world? That doesn't make sense. Can you think of one more corrupt? Yeah, I'm living in one. Yeah. I'm living in one. Uh, yes. You've done a hell of a thing on this earth, so you should not be the one to talk. You should be quiet when it comes to moral condemnation. In my judgment. I didn't mean to be so fired on. It was good. It was good. Right. <laughs> he, said, he said it was good. It was good. Like, I, I can't argue that. <laughs> but they don't, they don't, they don't want that. Mm -hmm. They don't want people that are like the young lady said, that's red. And then mm -hmm. their history and, mm -hmm. and uh, have done research and, and can defend their position, right? Well, it, it's, it, you know, they don't want people to speak truth to power, right? Yeah. That's, that's basically what it is, you know? Yeah. They don't and want, like, go ahead. If, if, if you continue to keep the people distracted and at odds with each other, they will never become red and understand what the real truth is. And that's what we have today. Absolutely. Absolutely. They don't want anybody to challenge their narrative. Mm. Right. But let me see if I can squeeze this one more in. All right. But check this out. There was that aunt that stood up to me. Yeah, but we can forget about him. Yeah, it was just one hand. <laughs> one hand. <laughs> You're right. It's just one hand. Yeah, boys. They're puny. Hmm, puny. Say, let's pretend this brain is a puny little ant. Did that hurt? <laughs> nope. Well, how about this one? Are you kidding? <laughs> well, how about this? You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. Mm. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? 
Right? Yeah, that says it all right there. <laughs> <laughs> says it all. Yeah. When is what movie was that from? Your tone matters. That was from... Really did Vance tone to... I think that was from A, a Bug's Life. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Bug's Life. But, but you can see that same concept of too many or one one of them rising up from the many to to uh to go against their system their established system has been a theme it's been a theme all the way back to pharaoh all right but i think i think uh, um the, the the we we timed out for the session and the sad thing i don't think i press record so you might, yeah. <laughs> you might not even have this information. It might be, it should be on uh, Master Allah's um, Facebook page, but um, we'll 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 stop here, and then we'll continue, um, inshallah, tomorrow. Um, so I get I get uh, four sessions the brother allowed me to do. So they'll they'll be. Uh, uh, Today and tomorrow, and then we have uh, April 15th and 16th. Um, so uh, if you if you like to come and, and participate in the, that session, that would be that would be great. But I appreciate y'all for, for coming out. Um, anybody, any last words or, before we close out the meeting? Yeah, just appreciate you know all your work and your efforts and and, and bringing this to us, man. Alhamdulillah. I appreciate exactly. y'all, man. I appreciate y'all. But um, yeah, most definitely we're gonna start getting into some some pretty uh heavy things. So <laughs> yeah, uh it, it, it should be it should be uh interesting. All right. All right, good good brothers and my sister that was there, sister Denise. All right, assalamu alaikum. Uh inshallah, I'll see y'all tomorrow. All right, well, All right. All right. All right. All right. Nope, didn't get it.